Welcome to Attraction in Action. Um, the reason why I call this program Attraction in Action is one, because it's an awesome name, but two, because uh, you cannot build attraction without, um, without taking these uh, concepts and using them and actually applying them. You can't learn how to do this without doing it. It took me several years to figure out how to get past the parts that I'm going to teach you over the next couple of days. And I've taken um, some of the most effective material that works. I've, I've shied away from teaching a lot of this stuff for a long time because I don't like to do like, I'm not usually a do this, don't do that kind of guy whenever I teach stuff because I like to really be broad and, and do psychology behind everything so the guys know what's behind it and what's making it work. Uh, but the uh, things I'm going to be covering over the next couple of days are going to be very focused on you know, how, to, how to approach and create attraction the right way, like specifically how to move your body, what to say, how to walk up. If she's walking down the street and she's walking toward you, what do you do to stop her? If she's walking in the same direction as you, as you what do you do to stop her? If it's at nighttime and you see a group of girls walking down the street, how do you stop them? If it's at a bar and there's one girl by herself and she's standing next to the bar, what do you say? You know, wh how do you move your body? If she's with friends, what do you say? So I'm going over a lot of material and uh, we'll be going over um, again, everything will have two spins on it, daytime and nighttime. Uh, there's a one specific reason why I'm doing this for daytime and nighttime. How many guys in here hate bars? Two, three. All right. I would be normally one of those guys, but uh, I got used to it. I like it now. Uh, but three guys hate bars. That means if I taught everything for nighttime, you would probably get nothing out of this. And, half, and most of the time I've met women that were higher quality, I met them during the daytime, um, just generally speaking. It doesn't mean that women at the bars are not high quality. I have heard guys say that before, and I, I disagree. I meet lots of girls during the daytime that are, are actually, that do go to bars, and there's no way that they're lower quality at nighttime than they are during the daytime. So I just wanted to sort of m let you guys know that when we get to that point, we're going to be going over um, everything that I have in this entire course is going to have two spins on it, daytime and nighttime. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is why that's important in the first place. Not just, you know, if you like to go out to bars, there's lots of other things you could do at nighttime. Um, that we can go out to parties and things like that too, or lounges or whatever, and hang out. Uh, but if, uh, if you use the same approach during the daytime as you do at nighttime, it won't work, and vice versa. And there's a, one major reason why that's the case. During the daytime, we have a uh, sort of psychological phenomenon where we feel like we can't hide. So there's a, this happens a lot in other, in other uh, uh, instances too. For example, when it's raining, is it, who here feels different when it's raining than they do whenever it's not raining? It just generally, uh, you know, with your life, it just feels weird. Um, one of the reasons why is because it's darker during the daytime, or you know, when you'd normally be awake walking around and everyone could see you. So you feel more exposed during the daytime. And so typically what people do is they don't have their guard up because they feel, they feel like everyone can see them already. So it's not a big deal. There's no option for them to hide during the daytime. So they just you know, they're, they're out, they're open, it's easy, right? So it's a lot simpler to stop people to talk to them. They're much more open to having a conversation, typically. At nighttime, especially in a bar, the typical pattern is that, you know, guys are going to be coming up trying to lie to, to women to get them in bed. That's like, every woman expects that to happen, so all their guards up. But not just that, at nighttime, we all feel like we can hide better because we can't see as far. So it's this weird psychological thing that, that, that happens to us throughout sort of the day and dusk and night, and it changes. So we change into two different people, one during the daytime and one at nighttime. So if you try to have a, a direct approach during the daytime and it works well for you, and then you switch over to nighttime and you try to do that, it's a completely different process and completely different, and it will very likely be the same woman in the same exact situation, but different time of day, uh, it won't work. And that's because we have a different mindset. So you have to be comfortable with these two different mindsets and you have to know how to handle each one uh, in any scenario. So I'll be going over that a lot. So first, I'm going to go over a concept called uh, getting ready, which is pretty, not very conceptual, I guess. It's pretty normal. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about how to dress. Uh, so there's like a, a formula, a fashion formula I'm going to give you guys so that you can figure out how to dress best for, for your own body type uh, and your personality. Uh, the next thing we're going to go over is, um, uh, let's see, how to assess what you're sort of getting yourself into and how to sort of keep your, what's called keeping your state up. Um, so whenever you assess what situation you're about to get into, you'll come up with a number, so have a system to help you kind of figure out a number of whatever the night's going to be like for you. And then you have to build your state up to that number before you get out, otherwise uh, you'll crash and burn. It will happen every time. So we're going to start from before you go out at all, um, and I want to tell you 
uh, a little bit about my going out ritual for me. So I spent a long time trying to just like go out and not do anything. And um, maybe it was probably two years that I thought that I could do this until I realized that's stupid and it wasn't working. I'd get to a bar and I would just sit there in the corner. And so I started, I realized one time that I, before I went out that I hung out with some friends first and then, um, and then went out and it was great. I had a great night and I was like, okay, well, what's the difference here? How come I was able to go out and have a good time this time and not other times? And what it turns out is that we have a major gap uh, between the energy level of the place we're going to and the energy level in which we currently are before we get there. And to bridge that gap when we show up uh, ruins our interactions because we walk in the door and we're spending the first 15 minutes getting our state up to the point where we're at the same level as the people who are, who are there. And everyone's pretty much already seen us at that point and we're already a buzzkill. So we sort of ruin the, imp ruin the entire night for ourselves and then we sit in the corner and do nothing, right? Or at least I did. Um, so for a couple of years, I tried to do that. Eventually, I switched over to another system for doing this. And that system I'm going to cover today uh, during this process. But uh, basically, I, I figured out that if I'm able to somehow uh, lift my state up, is what it's called, so your state is your energy level, lift your state up to the level right above where you think everyone's going to be in the bar. So I had a few different ways to figure out where I'm going to be going. I went to a lot of places that were familiar. So I knew on like a Saturday night at this place it was going to be like this loud and this many people would be there and you know this busy. And so I would go from my sort of normal hanging out mode over to this you know, you know preparing myself to get ready for this place. And if I did it properly then uh, every time I got there I'd have a great night and it would be really positive and I'd get great responses and all, everyone that I approached would be happy and respond back and be really open and receptive. Otherwise it was really really difficult um, has anyone here ever, I'm sure that everyone's done this before, but uh, gone into a bar with the intent of like having a good time and then uh, walking up and talking to one group of people and then they don't like you or like they don't respond well and so the whole night sucks? Um, I remember whenever I, was, whenever I first started doing this, I went out to a bar in D.C. and I, uh, I'm going to borrow your, actually I'll, I'll use this. So I went up uh, to a group, there's two girls standing there and they both had drinks and I was like, I'm just going to cheers them and in my head this all was going to go perfect. I was going to walk up, I was going to cheers them and they were going to go, Hey, all right, a guy I don't know. What's your name? Let's hang out. I was like, that was what was going to happen. I was like, this is going to be awesome. So I went up and I was like, cheers. And they both went, why? And I was like, uh, I don't know. Um, be uh, because we're, I'm awesome? And they were like, Pfft. And so I, I was like, oh, man, it sucked. I was over with a friend, and I'll tell you what he said in a minute. But so eventually I was like standing there, and I was really awkward. You know, so I go, you know what? It's probably best that you don't cheers me because I have herpes. I, so I don't have herpes, by the way. But I said that, and then they both laughed, and then I left, right? So as soon as it started going well, I, I ejected. And this was like really patterned for me, like typical, you know? I would get up, I would get a positive response, I would make someone laugh, and then I would leave because I was like, oh, this is going well, I should probably end on a high note, you know? <laughs> and the whole night, or as soon as, I, as soon as that happened, I, uh, I turned to my friend, and it was like, like, like textbook. Now that I'm, I've been doing this for a living for a while, I see this in guys all the time, I had what's called an excuse process. As soon as you get rejected, you have, your subconscious mind begins to take over and go, this is bad for you. This is really bad for you. You need to leave right now. You're hungry. You're hungry and you're tired and your legs hurt. And it just starts making shit up. And so you're like, oh man. So I ended up going, I turned to my friend John. He's like, dude, no one's here. This sucks. And he goes, no one's here? And I was like, yeah, this is stupid. I hate this. And everyone's like, I'm, I'm standing in a huge room full of people, and they're all like, woo, having a great time. And I just got rejected, so, I'm, so then everything sucked to me. So he was like, dude, you're being retarded. You need to just snap out of this. Like, go walk around for a little while and come back. So I did. I came back, and I was like, I'm sorry. I feel better now. But most guys, and including myself, we, we just go, well, we think that we feel that way. It's just the truth, and, and we, can, we just get rid of it. We stop, right? And this all happens typically before we walk in in the first place. And so I'm going to go over that uh, right now. Um, like it or not, people will judge you as soon as they see you. The moment they see you for the very first time. Everyone in this room did that to me. Uh, not today, because everyone in this room has seen me before. But um, you did it the first time you saw me. Right? So as soon as you see me for the first time, everyone does that. You get your subconscious mind tries to put everyone into a folder. So you'll look at somebody and, um, and you'll go, okay. You'll assess everything about them in that moment. And you'll try to put them in a folder in your head. Like you'll go, okay, well, they belong here in this, in this folder. So whatever folder you put me in, I don't want to know about, really. It could be weird. 
definitely sexy. It was labeled sexy on it. But whenever we do that, we meet people and we put them in that folder. And then um, if we can put them in a folder quickly, we forget about them. And we were talking a little bit about uh, patterns earlier um, and how to break patterns. Uh, you, whenever we have like an autopilot response to something, like for example, if I were to say, how you doing? Great. Great. That's an autopilot response, right? Uh, how you doing, you sexy thing? That's not an autopilot response anymore. You know? That's not going to get great. That's going to be like, awesome, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You shouldn't be worried about me. You should be worried about you. <laughs> um, so whenever you break a pattern, you uh, create a new folder. Whenever you create a new folder in someone's mind, they remember you, essentially. So you have to break patterns. You have to do this. And one way to do it, or if you're going to get into a pattern, get into, make sure you fall into a pattern or a, fall into a folder that is attractive guy. That's the folder you want to fall into. Or guy I want to know more about, or guy who looks interesting. That's what attraction is curiosity, remember. So, you have to make sure that you're creating curiosity when you walk in. Now, not all attraction is created equal. Um, you can be curious about someone, you can be curious about a bum on the side of the street that's got like a furry hat and makeup. <laughs> furry hat and makeup. Um, I was just kind of referencing a, a guy you know. Um, so if you, uh, you can do that when you walk in, but the problem is uh, when you do that, you get into a, a sort of nudist Buddhist kind of folder, which is like too weird. You get too weird. Um, we have a friend, uh, one of our friends says, uh, you can be a nudist and you can be a Buddhist, but you can't be a nudist Buddhist <laughs> because people won't accept that. <laughs> people will accept that you're a nudist because that's a little different. That's okay. And you're a Buddhist. Okay, you're a Buddhist. That's cool. But you can't be both. People are like, well, that's too weird yet. I can't be a part of this. All right. So when you walk in, you want to create curiosity. But you don't want to be a weirdo. You don't want to be like someone who's like, whoa. They want to, they want, you want to be someone where they've seen this pattern before. They've seen someone act this way before, and that guy was an attractive, confident guy. And um, let me tell you the one thing that you're trying to create during this entire process. This is sort of the bottom line of attraction. We have a... Um, who in here has seen the video that I, I did with the goldfish in the beginning? Has anyone seen that? I don't think anyone's seen that in this room. <laughs> That's great. I'll tell you about what it is. Everyone, everyone who helped me make it, it's like, I spent so long on that video. Um, so, okay, so in that video, I, I cover some concept that's really, uh, really, really powerful. It's basically at the core of everything that we, um, that we do in order to attract women. Everything that women are, are attracted to. And that is, uh, it's all related to, and this is how I, I, I sort of taught it, it's all related to a fish, or guppies, essentially. In uh, the animal kingdom, in that world, guppies, female guppies look to, uh, to find male guppies that are the brightest color orange. And the reason why they do this is because Male guppies, who are the brightest color orange, are the healthiest. So they want to have you know, the greatest possibility their offspring is going to survive, so they try to find a healthy male to mate with. But if two males are close to the same color orange, or brightness of orange, then um, a really strange phenomenon happens. And that is all of the female guppies will mate with the one male that all the other female guppies are mating with. Now this is really, really important. The reason why they do this is because they can't tell the difference between a, you know, a male guppy that is that are both the same color. They can't tell the difference between which one's more um, likely to, to create you know, healthy offspring. So they, they, judge the, they trust the judgment of all the rest of the females, and they go with the one. So there's one that was just as good as the other one that's not getting any kind of mating happen, happening, any attraction in action. And the other one's getting everything, and there's no real reason why. Right? Except that, that the other male created the first, uh, started mating first, and then everyone saw that. All the other females saw that, right? So in our society, we are all the same color orange now, as far as that goes, right? We're all, we, you cannot tell if uh, a, a one man is going to be uh, better at supporting you than another man just by looking at him. It doesn't happen anymore. Uh, unfortunately for women, they can't go by, like, okay, well, that guy's bigger, and therefore he's stronger, and therefore he's going to survive. That's not necessarily the case, because we live in a world of social rules now. Not, it's not survival of the fittest anymore, it's survival of the socially fittest now. And so as, we, as women begin to look at us, they start to not really care as much about uh, how big we are, how strong we are, um, how good we are hunting. <laughs> no, that stuff doesn't matter. You, if you can go to the grocery store, you can get food. You know? It's more about social skills and your ability to have a uh, sort of social superpower to sort of dominate, social dominance, and social providing, and social protecting. So because everyone's leveled the playing field with society, our social rules have leveled the playing field, 
all women now turn to the default, the next thing, which is, well, what are the other girls doing? And that's exactly what creates attraction. Women are looking for a man that acts like other women already want him. That's the bottom line. It's called pre-selection. Pre-selection is the assumption that other women already want you, or creating the assumption that other women already want you. Everything that I write in the Tao of Badass and that I've ever taught is uh, geared toward you creating this pre-selection. To make people think, when they first meet you, that you have a waiting list of women to date you. Uh, Brett, I remember the moment you grasped, grasped this uh, concept. Whenever you were like starting to get it, you're like, oh, and as soon as you did, you became polyamorous, and then you like had women all over you. you know? And that's sort of what happens when you flip the switch. As soon as you recognize, if, if you ran everything through a filter that was really accurate that said, uh, well, what would a guy who's got a lot of choices for women do right now? And you just did that all the time, then you'd, you'd attract women, always. Body language, uh, eye contact, uh, banter lines, everything that I teach is geared toward that one specific thing. It's modeled off of and broken down from guys who have had uh, lots of options with women. Once I adopted this concept to my life, that's when everything started shifting. But one thing you have to uh, do first is create the belief that you're already that guy. If you don't create that belief, you can't possibly control everything in your body. It just will not happen. There's certain things that are, that are going to slip up and you're going you're gonna to screw up over and over and over again because there's just too many variables. It's impossible right, to do that. So and what you want to do is use all of your brain to, uh, to help this work, to make this happen. And so that's one belief. The one belief that will make you um, more successful than any other belief, if you can just accept this, even if you feel like you're lying to yourself in the beginning, and, uh, and accept it over time, is um, I'm hot. If you can make yourself believe I'm hot, and I go over how to do that actually in the, in the Tao of Badass, if you haven't read through that whole thing. Um, if you can create the I'm hot belief, then you will automatically begin to attract women. It's almost like a, you become on their radar all of a sudden. Like you pop up and they're, you're, an, you're an option for them and you weren't before. So uh, people do judge you instantly for a very good reason. They're judging to see whether or not other women are attracted to you or you act like other women are attracted to you. And there's a really great book called Blink. Uh, has anyone here read that book? You read that book? You're the only one who reads in here. <laughs> Blink, um, I, would, I only hesitated to make it required reading because I hate reading, but it's, uh, it's one of the books that if I, had, if I was going to make a required reading list, it would be one of them. Um, that and another book called My Secret Garden, if you haven't read that book. That book is phenomenal. That's a collection of anonymous women's sexual fantasies. If you think that you understand women, read that book and then tell me if, you, if you, uh, we're wrong <laughs> after that. Um, I was, that totally expanded my mind when I saw that. It was phenomenal. I loved it. Um, and that's, again, that would be mandatory reading as well. Um, Blink is written by a guy named Malcolm Gladwell. I forgot about My Secret Garden. By the way, don't get that mixed up with The Secret Garden. The Secret Garden is a <laughs> children's book. <laughs> and you'll be like, what does this have to do with women? <laughs> I don't get it. It's, a, it's all a metaphor, man. Um, so the book Blink, though, uh, is really, really crucial, and it changed my perception of a lot of things. And in fact, made me uh, redevelop my system for uh, understanding attracting women because um, most guys look at uh, attracting women as it, it's sort of taking place at the moment that they say hello. The moment they walk up, that's called the approach, right? When you walk up and you go talk to her. But that's not what happens. Uh, you're sort of skipping over one of those powerful processes that women trust the most. Women do what? Trust their emotions, really. They, they, most women are, are feelers, and they trust their, their gut on almost everything. They'll go, I get a weird feeling about this guy. That's why they say this guy creeps me out rather than this guy won't stop facing me with his body, which is what creeps me out means, right? Or leaning toward me and being sexual. They don't know that. They don't know that because they don't have to. They have a gut response to it. So that gut response is actually a really, really, really intelligent process. And it's, um, it's sort of the way that your subconscious mind communicates with your conscious mind. So your subconscious processes 10,000 bits of information for every one bit of information that your conscious mind processes. 10,000 to 1. So if you're aware of looking around this room and the things that you're seeing, your subconscious mind takes in all that information times 10,000. It remembers everything. I glance over down here, I can tell you what you've written down later. If my subconscious mind can tell you what, what you've written down later and repeat it back and even write it out exactly the same way because your subconscious mind is photographic. Now, 
it can't communicate directly with your conscious mind because then you'd be aware of it. That would make you conscious of it, and that would just sort of defeat the purpose of you having a wall there to hide that from you. It's just too much information for you to process. So it communicates through a specific language, and that language is emotion. Women see a guy, assess him instantly, and then have a feeling about him. That's all that happens. You have to attract a woman in that few seconds that they scan you first. So you're not digging yourself out of a hole. It's not about how you look, like you know, you're, whether or not you're a good looking guy or not. It's not about whether or not you're tall, short, you're losing your hair like me, or you've got a full head of hair. You know, none of that stuff matters. Or you're weak or strong. What matters is how you carry yourself and how you respond to other people. There's two things. Called, it's called content and context. Context is how people respond to you. Content is what you're saying with your body language. If both of those things are saying the same message, which is that lots of women are attracted to me, then uh, you win. But if one of them says something else, then you're not going to win. That's how it is, especially if they both say something else. So you have two different sort of things to do here. It's two different very huge uh, tasks. One is to control your body so that you're constantly saying that message to, to women and to everyone around you. And the second is controlling your environment. This one can be more difficult. But controlling your environment, we're going to go over. Um, to make it seem as though your immediate surroundings are all about you. Even if you're just walking through them and not many people are actually looking at you at the moment. Right? So, for example, let's talk about rejection. I'm going to go over this a little bit uh, later on as well. Um, was one huge hack that I learned about rejection that, um, that turned my life around when it came to attracting women. And that is, I realized that no one in the, in the entire place that I'm at has any idea I'm being rejected except me and the two girls who are rejecting me or the girl that's rejecting me or whatever, right? So what I started doing was pretending like it wasn't happening while well, it was happening. So I'd go up and talk to a girl and she was like, leave us alone. We want to be alone. I'd be like, all right. And she started yelling and stuff. I was like, whoa. Like, and then it looked like when other girls turned around and looked, it looked like some girl was like, like coming at me and really like trying to get my attention and stuff. And I was like, whoa, and smiling and like looking at other people and they were laughing. So whenever I started doing that, women who saw it would come up to me afterwards and go, hey, what happened over there? But if I was like, oh, shit, I screwed up, and I walk off, no one would talk to me for the rest of the night. I was a leper. You know? No one would talk to me. So this was like a huge turning point for me in realizing that I can actually control my environment and, uh, and still have responses from people that, that work that, and go in the direction that I want them to go in. Because before I thought that I was, in, I was sort of, uh, I was a victim of my, of my environment. I was uh, sort of, I had to, um, if, if the environment, I went into the environment and then I sort of planned my in, myself in and then I was rejected, that I was rejected, the end. That was how it was, the end. Like, the people had spoken, you know, and I, was, I didn't belong there. But that's not the case. Uh, instead, we have a lot more control over the context than we think we do. And I'll go into that a little bit later on. So again, we're going to be going over to, uh, in the get ready section, uh, how to assess what you're getting yourself into for the night, which is really important. I'll grab this. Um, sort of how to dress the, to best suit your personality and your body, which is a lot of guys do wrong. And then uh, sort of how to distract yourself, basically, uh, to make sure that you don't drop state before you get there. How to keep your state up and keep yourself happy uh, and, and get yourself going before you get there. So first, I want to go over style. Um, I know that some guys in the room have studied style, because I can tell. Um, mainly people who have faux hawks. Oh, wait, you too. <laughs> I've studied a bit, and they sort of dress um, uh, dress in a specific way, and, and it, could be, it could be best for your personality, it might not be. Um, the, but there are three different major body types that you have to think about here. One is that um, uh, swimmer's build. A swimmer's build is like me, um, also like Jay in the back, um, really thin. Uh, you have a swimmer's build as well. So it's like a slender, tall, or taller, slender build. There's, if I tried to dress um, that in, a, in a way that didn't accentuate my body currently, it would make me look like frumpy. It just does. There's a reason why people who have a swimmer's build typically wear uh, tighter fitting clothes because you want to accentuate something. When you have a swimmer's build, you want to accentuate your height, even if you're not that tall. You want to accentuate how tall you are. There's a reason why I wear these. These things are like three and a half inch, have three and a half inch heel on them. You know, I don't always wear them, but sometimes I do. There's a reason why all my, all my clothes, like I don't, my clothes don't have a really, my pants don't have like a low crotch or anything. I'm trying to accentuate how long my legs are and how tall my torso is. 
Now, if you have uh, the other major type of, of body, even if you're out of shape, is uh, powerlifters build. This is broad shoulders, and it typically tapers down, uh, but you have a, tip, a strong, broad, wide shoulders. This is, you cannot dress to accentuate your height if you have broad, wide shoulders. You just cannot do it. It will look really funny if you do it. Um, it looks like a, uh, an olive on top of a toothpick if you do that. <laughs> uh, instead, you want to accentuate your shoulders or your back. So from here to here, you want to accentuate that. Uh, you have sort of a more power, power uh, lifters build. So you accentuate your back. So yours isn't about tight fitting torso, clothes, or anything like that. It's more about making sure that whenever you put your shirt on, it's stretched across the back, basically. Because that's going to accentuate power. I'm going to, mine, I'm going to accentuate sexuality because I'm thinner. Men who are, have that power lifters build are going to accentuate power instead. You want to use this uh, just to your advantage. I'm going to go through the room and just kind of uh, point out people and tell you what, what you have so you have it. Swimmers build in the back. You have power lifters, power lifter. Uh, you're a swimmer, swimmer. I think we know about that, power lifter. You're tall too, which is interesting. So you can probably go either way with that. Uh, you're going to be power lifter. Uh, which is funny. <laughs> I'm not sure if you consider yourself that or not. Uh, you're the same way and you're the same way. So everyone over here, all powerlifter build. So if, you're, if you've been dressing the opposite way, you don't want to do that. Um, if you feel like you've got a little bit of extra weight or if you think the age is an issue for you, um, here's the biggest faux pas I see you guys do in style is they're older and they try to dress younger. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. You don't have to. I, never, I almost never wear anything that has something written on it. Like I just, all my shirts are just blank shirts. I don't like to advertise typically for people. Um, I have a lot of my shirts are like that, basically. Just straight up regular shirts. Yeah, you have a really nice, comfortable style too. Like it suits your body really well and your personality. If you feel like age is an issue, never do what most guys do who are older, and that is uh, try to dress younger to feel younger and to like, you know, it just doesn't work. Instead, it seems like you're not comfortable with your age, which is exactly what, happen what, what th the truth is. So instead, if you feel like you're maybe a little bit overweight or out of shape, and, uh, or you, you, you feel like you you can't really uh, dress younger because you feel like you're a little bit older, that's an issue in your head, then you want to dress to accentuate your class. Accentuate your class. Accentuate something that is um, refined over time, something that younger guys can't do. So as you get older, you get more attractive as a guy. This is a lot of older guys have no idea this is the case. Uh, we're the only, uh, we're, we're lucky actually because we're guys and we're appreciating assets. Women typically aren't appreciating assets. They get, they get less valuable over time. <laughs> no offense, obviously. Um, but women then shift from being, you know, uh, from, from it being about looks to being about something else. For guys, it's about refinement. It's about your ability to, um, to understand uh, lessons and be wiser. So you want to and need to, as you get older, accentuate that. Really highlight that. Don't try to, you know, play young, dumb, naive guy. It won't work. It'll just look, you'll look pathetic because you should be more uh, worldly at this point, you know, and you are. You have a lot more experience. So, and women uh, are, uh, many, many women are attracted to older men, um, much older men, uh, and a lot of guys don't know that. So, um, so those are the three major body types. So two, two major ones are swimmers build and body, lift, uh, body, li body lifter, <laughs> power lifters build. <laughs> I'm going to have some water in a minute and stop drinking coffee. Um, and then if you have sort of age or some kind of insecurity that's, that's sort of holding you back, you want to accentuate your classiness instead. What do you mean by that? So, for example, um, if you have, uh, okay, so this, like, oh, I'm tapping the microphone, sorry. Uh, this shirt is uh, doing two things right now. It's accentuating class and accentuating height. Because it's form-fitting, it's not broad shoulders, you know, not like going out. If it was a little bit wider here and it wasn't, didn't taper out at the end, then it would be, like, it would accentuate my back a little bit more. But I'm dressing up a little bit, like, a little bit nicer. Instead of uh, trying to hide stuff in my body, I'm going to dress up instead. So, for example, a guy walks into a, a, a bar with a suit on. If a, if a young kid walks into a bar with a suit on, he's overcompensating. If an older guy walks into a bar with a suit on, he's classy. Period. And that's just how it is. And the reason why that happens is because we have, again, a blink association with people that we see. If you have, uh, now keep this in mind, you don't have a blink association with yourself. <laughs> you don't know that. You look in the mirror every single day, you've been doing that every day of your life. So you don't know what it's like when other people see you for the first time. We get wrapped up in what we think people see. And that's not actually what they see. They see a very surface area, like, you know, it's not deep. It's not, they're not going to look past all your insecurities or look past all the things that, like, you know, to get down to your real deep personality, see who you are. They don't care. They're just doing quick 
once over, OK, got you. Once over, got you. So that once over, what, what they see when they do that needs to reflect uh, who you actually are and what your positive qualities are. So what most guys do is they'll reflect uh, what, what they're compensating for. They're trying to hide something. You know? For example, I wouldn't wear that jacket, not just because it's an extreme jacket, but I wouldn't wear that jacket uh, if I were you with your body type. I would wear something uh, a little bit more uh, formal. Just general, just generally speaking. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I mean, that's nice. I like it, but, but I probably wouldn't wear it very often unless it was like, you, you know, I was using it. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, exactly. And I would, I would not wear that one ever, really, because why would you wear that when you, don't, when you have a nicer jacket? That makes you look better, you know? Like, that's, I had to go through my closet and just be like, why am, I, why am I wearing this stuff? Why am I doing this? It's because we have stuff we've worn for a long period of time. We think there's two different modes. There's not two different modes. The way you walk, the way you dress, the way you talk, everything has to be the same whether or not you're in your apartment by yourself going to get something out of the fridge or if you're at a club walking to get a drink from the bar. It has to be exactly the same. If you start dressing up to go places, you'll start to put on a fake persona when you do it. And you'll automatically start to hide the things you think people don't like. And you don't know what people don't like about you. You have no idea. You guys don't know. It took me forever to figure out mine. You know, and I thought mine was something completely different. You know what I thought mine was first? That I grew up in a trailer park. I thought people didn't like that. That they thought that that was stupid. But no one had any idea I, that I grew up in a trailer park. No one had any clue. But I just carried it with me like baggage everywhere I went. And women could sort of smell it. They'd be like, something's wrong. Like, you seem cool, but there's something off that you're, you're running away from. They don't know what it is, but they don't want to find out. They'll just leave. You know? So anything that you have that doesn't already accentuate your body type, throw it away. And just re replace it with other stuff that does. Just get rid of all that stuff. You don't want it to be an option for you. You, know, you don't want to put it on and go, OK, well, this is, this is good enough. You don't want to do that. You know, you have, this is the one area where it's the easiest to change. You just go to the store and just buy stuff. You know? You're good. You know, if you don't have a whole lot of money, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you get stuff. You don't settle for something that's good enough for you to wear. You know? Keep that in mind. So we're going to go, go into something um, uh, a little bit here that uh, sort of helps you design your, your fashion sense, sort of. Right? And it's different for every person. Each person has a different past, a different future, a different present. And, and we have uh, different aspirations. And so we can dress differently because of that. Uh, who here has um, heard my sort of process of um, of figuring out savoir faire or um, sort of becoming a man, which is who am I, who are you, how do I show you who I am? You gone through it? I'm going to go ahead and toss this up here. I came up with the concept uh, sort of by accident um, that I was trying to figure out how I can wear stuff like white boots and other people can't get, do it and get away with it. I was like, how come I can do this? How come I can wear white boots, you know, jeans? And like a torn up t-shirt. Like 90% of my shirts have holes in them. I just, but I can get away with it somehow. Tim hates that though. <laughs> doesn't like that. Um, so I was trying to break that down and figure out uh, why it is I'm able to do that and some people can't. And they can pull stuff off that I can't do. And I ended up coming up with a concept that was beyond fashion, which I'll sort of go in here, here in a bit. And here's what it is. This is the first question that you all have to ask yourselves. Now there are different ways to figure this answer out. I'll get into that in a minute. Who am I? If you do not know who you are, you can't show yourself to other people. That's pretty straightforward, right? And this seems like intrinsic, obvious knowledge. But almost no one does this. They skip over this because it's really difficult. Next question. This is where everyone typically starts. That's how to read people. Who are you? How to look at somebody and not know who they are and assess who they are pretty quickly and get them, understand them. Now, most people think that the gold is here. The gold is not here. The gold's in the third one. The third one takes a minute to write. Which is, how do I show you who I am? It's a W. <laughs> that works. How do I show you who I am? If you can't answer these three questions, then you will never be good at this. And they are big, big questions to ask. The who am I question is the biggest question. This is where everyone skips. They go straight to who are you. Instead, they want to get stuff like, oh, I don't want to look inside. I want to look outside and just figure this, all this stuff out. Because we think we have this down. Here's what the who am I section is all about. Who am I is going to help you dress today? So I'm going to go over what it is. Then 
So your past, your heroes, and your future. Let's talk a little bit about this. If you break down who you are, you're essentially a collection of um, uh, being proud of your past, where you came from. You can never change that, so you have to be proud of it. If you're not proud of it, you don't move on. You can't do anything else down here, period. You have to get, be proud of your past first and proud of it, where you came from. And that means that you're going to have shit that you are ashamed of that you're going to have to be proud of instead, which is crazy, and it's really complicated. Typically what I do, if you want to do this on your own, you can. This class isn't going to be about this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with it. But if you want to be proud of your past, write down five things that you're ashamed of in your life. Write them down, and then look at each one, and then look at it until you can be proud of it, because it made you who you are now, even though you screwed up or something happened to you. If you can do this, you'll be able to go, well, you'll be way ahead of most people, first off. Most guys never do this. It's really complicated to get through your brain to find these things in the first place. But you have to be proud of it. Most of the things that hold guys back and the insecurities that hold guys back are based on things that happened to them 40, 30, 20 years ago. And they never let them go. They never became proud of them. And in fact, everything they did after that in their lives was to compensate for that one thing they were ashamed of, or the few things they were ashamed of. I've done a lot of things I was ashamed of, and some of them were really, really, really hard for me to, to be proud of, you know, because I screwed up. Everyone does. So that's one. The next one was your, the positive qualities of your heroes. This is important because it allows you to, to uh, develop yourself right now. If you want to, um, again, on your own time, if you want to, uh, figure out how to um, gain the positive qualities of your heroes. Write down 10 people that you respect, and then next to that, write down the reasons why you respect them. Just one word for each one. And then focus on just gaining those qualities. Anything you respect in someone else, you already have in yourself, but you're trying to cultivate. Otherwise, you don't respect that quality in someone else. It doesn't, doesn't happen like that. You don't respect a quality that you don't have. No one does. We just don't think we have it at the level that they do. I'm going to go over how this is going to help you dress in a minute, by the way. And then last is your happiness in the future. This, if you don't know um, where you're headed, then you cannot uh, sort of understand who you are. Once you're proud of where you came from, you understand your heroes, you take on those positive qualities automatically, and then you know the direction that you're going, you're good. That's you. Now, this one changes over time, of course. So we're going to do an exercise in a bit here. But first, let's go over the fashion formula. It's going to use these three, these three things here. The past, your heroes, and your future. Let me go over here. OK, cool. Fashion formula. So whenever you think about sort of creating your closet or creating anything that you put together that you're going to wear at any given moment, you're going to be using about um, fifty percent of what you wear and how you wear it is going to be based on your past, what you've always worn, or what people in your community wore whenever you were younger. This is really, really important. So we'll do fifty percent is. Uh, I'll just put community up here, which, besides being an awesome, funny show, is uh, referencing. What people wore whenever you were probably younger. Typically, whenever you were, you know, growing up, what people were wearing. Now, if you were in a different, it was a very different time than like Leave It to Beaver time. People were wearing different stuff. You you can still access that, and most people don't do that. They try to upgrade to you know current times, and they they don't really get it down right. So fifty percent is going to be uh, what people in your community war back then. Next is going to be, let's see, 40% is going to be where you're headed in life and what you're going to be wearing then. Now this is what's really interesting. I had to create an exercise for this because it was really difficult to explain this. So here's what we're going to do. Open up your binders, your worksheets. The first page after I'm talking to you and being like, hey. 
All right, you guys see that giant box? Here's what I want you to do. We're going to spend about five minutes, and I want you to imagine yourself 10 years in the future from now. Just close your eyes for a minute and imagine yourself 10 years in the future. The only thing that has to be there is that you have to be confident and happy in the future. So if you're thinking about it and you imagine yourself being bummed out or like sitting in a jail cell shaking, that's not going to help. In the shower with your clothes on scrubbing, that's not going to work. So just close your eyes and do that now and think about your life 10 years in the future and imagine that you're completely happy and confident as a man. And then look at what you're wearing. As soon as you get a pretty good beat on it, start to write it down. You can take your time with this. If you have a couple different versions of this, that's okay too. You picture yourself wearing one thing, then picture yourself wearing another thing. Trying to picture yourself being confident and completely happy while entertaining children in a clown suit. That'll make this kind of complicated. Just a little bit longer here. All right, wrap that up. So about 40% of what you wear and what's in your closet should be stuff that you're leading into that you just thought about. This basically allows you to feel like you have the permission to become that person. Whenever I did this, my um, dream of the future, I was, uh, I, don't, I, mean, I don't know if this is ever going to happen or not, but I was a professor. So I had like, and I was coming, I was walking and I had a jacket on because I had to look professional and I had a tie, but it wasn't like flashy, it was brown, you know, like normal like brown tweed jacket, you know, like normal <laughs> professor jacket. I had glasses and a beard. Um, so I got to start growing that beard now if I'm ever going get it, to uh, get it going. But Whenever I, as soon as I did this exercise, I immediately switched over to being more uh, professional looking in my closet. Less about chilling and hanging out and everything, and more about having, you know, about a little less than half my closet was more professional, was slimmer cut, more, uh, more of like a surface, like um, aesthetically pleasing look <laughs> for me, instead of it being so uh, relaxing and, and um, just chill, which is what typically it looked like before. 
So this, this shifted me big time. It also allowed me to, when I walked into a room with 40% of my outfit being, you know, that person that I'm going to be, it allowed me to embody 40% of my personality of being that person now. So I was able to take part of my personality and become that person now instead of waiting 10 years in the future. And that's what will happen to you too. Did anyone find, like, when they're imagining, they, anyone have anything weird pop up? Like, something they didn't expect? No, yes, no, maybe so. Okay, well that's good. Did you do it as well? Yeah, I did. What did you, uh, what'd you have? Um, I'd say the one that surprised me was really long tattoos. Tattoos? Yeah. All right. <laughs> your, parents, your parents can already be upset with that. Yeah. Um, you should get everything I have in my arm, but get it in Spanish. <laughs> On German. German, get it in German, yeah. What's it, ya? Yeah? Did I say ya yeah right here? I have a big yes tattoo right here. You guys can't see my arm, I guess, right now. But I have tattoos all over my arm. Um, all right. Hmm? Oh, sure. Did you picture yourself in the future while you're doing this? Yeah. Okay, cool. And that's what you saw? Yeah, really nice mm -hmm. clothes. It's very simple. Yep. Not too costly. Yep. Overdressing. Mm -hmm. Like me? I guess I don't think this is like overdressing. I mean, I got the shoes, obviously. That's like the one thing. So this is uh, the last thing's 10%, the last 10% of your outfit, which is like an extra little, like adds a little bit of uh, spice to it, is, uh, you know, imagine, if you imagine what your heroes wear. Now, I don't want you to put a cape down, obviously, because that's not what I want you to wear. But if you have heroes, you know, fictional or non-fictional, um, you can take some that you, you admire how they dress, and you can take a part of that, and you can put it on your outfit. But you don't want to do too much of that, because then you embody somebody else, and you don't want to do that. You have to have you first, and then just a little bit of something else in here that Im influences you right now. And this can shift over time. When I got these boots, that's what I was doing. Um, when I got, uh, when I started buying more suits, I was doing that too. When the guy that I used, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm not sure if you guys know who this is, but there's a cartoon. Who in here has seen a cartoon called Cowboy Bebop? Anybody? Yeah, okay. So Spike is the main character of that cartoon. He was like my hero, when, right when I first started getting into this. And I would, I would like, I was him for Halloween once when I had hair. <laughs> I had a lot more hair then. Um, and that was for me, uh, when I started adding that into, again, it gave me this sort of extra, extra kick to feel like I was sort of stepping into something that I, I wasn't normally. So I stepped outside my comfort zone a little bit. If you just do stuff that's you and not step outside of it a little bit, you'll never grow. Uh, so you have to do something a little bit different to get that sort of extra kick. And if it doesn't make you uncomfortable when you first put it on, then it's not good enough. When I bought these boots, I was downstairs at, um, actually this is my second pair. The first pair I bought were white snakeskin boots. Because I was like, I'm just going to go all out in this. You know, it was like 80 bucks on Zappos or something. And I ordered them in New York. They came downstairs, and the door guy was there, and I opened them up, and he was like, what? <laughs> what is that? I was like, these are my boots. And he was like, those aren't girls? <laughs> like, and I was like, OK, well, I'm going to have to get through this, you know? He's like, no, they're mine. So he still calls me dude, dude with boots. He's from another country. So he said, dudes with boots. Um, his name's Zaim. He's a great guy. But, so he'll remember me as that guy forever, because I sort of stepped outside of that role and became this new person when I was around him. Then I bought these, and I started just buying a bunch of them and being comfortable with it. It took me about three days to really be comfortable with it. First few days I was walking around and I was like, uh, everyone's looking at my boots. And they were, but that's okay. You know, yep. Does that represent the teachers, the heroes, or? Heroes, yeah. This was um, the Modern Gentleman guys. So, so you know, um, there's a book called The Modern Gentleman, uh, written by two guys. Phineas Malad and Jason Tassaro. And um, before I got into this, uh, into coaching, I ended up meeting these guys. They were like my biggest heroes. I ended up meeting them. I met them because I, I, I wrote uh, the publisher and said I wanted to do an interview with one of them. And then I was like, hey, there's no interview, by the way. I just want to talk to you. And he was like, OK. So he started, we started emailing back and forth. And then one day, one of the guys showed up at my, uh, showed up at my um, house with a bunch of wine and said, hey. And they just sat down and had a bunch of wine with me and taught me stuff. And, and it was great. And we became really close friends. 
And so I, after I met them, I was like, I gotta have that flashy, that like, you know, that like, you know, like kind of like in the casino, like rolling around and being flashy, kind of part of my personality, because that's what they had. They had like the cigars and the top hats, and not top hats, but the fedoras, you know. And they were just like this specific kind of guy who was like a dying breed, you know, ascots and shit, like awesomeness. And I, I was like, I can't, I don't want to do that other stuff, but I do want the boots, so I got the boots, you know. Um, so I think the one, the one part of your hero, 10% of your outfit that's your heroes should be a little bit uncomfortable because it's not part of your past and it's not part of your future.